Hey, welcome back. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining the channel. Hope you're all well. And welcome back to part three of the Harman Kardon 330 series videos I'm making. This one is the 330C. It's the last in the series. Now, Harman Kardon did go out and continue making 330s. Uh, they made an HK330i, I think it was called. And it was a more modern version, a sleek design. Didn't look anything like the predecessors. Um, still, it was a it was an entry level receiver for budget minded people. Um, they wanted to make it sound good for those that didn't have a lot of money, and um, I think they achieved that. So, with the 330 series, I think they sold a lot of these. And there's a lot of them around, and uh, if you can get your hands on one, they're 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 good they're good gems to pick up and have in a collection, or even use as a daily driver. It's an excellent machine. So we're going to go through this one, just like we did with the other two. We're going to look at its changes uh, as it evolved. And we're going to look at uh, maybe some room for improvements. Um, this one in particular, I purchased off eBay probably three, four years ago now. Uh, it arrived as a non-working unit. And I plugged it in, and sure enough, it didn't work. But then when I went to the back, there's a speaker fuse that was blown. This is it. I think it's, uh, let's see here, what is this? It was a one amp and it was placed in the speaker fuse holder. Uh, but I do believe this one works. I haven't plugged it in a while. Let's plug it in. I think it powers up and everything, so let's try it. Jumps up to 20 some watts, comes back down to 16. Yeah, it looks all, looks all normal. Looks like we might have a light out in the middle here. It's kind of dim in the center. Uh, let's see here. What do we have for. No movement on the meter. It might be stuck. I don't know, a lot of these have stuck meters now, due with age. But I'm on FM stereo and I'm not getting any response out of the tuner. Let's try AM, same thing. Of course, I don't have any speakers hooked up. Let me connect a set of speakers while we're right back. Okay, I'm back with speakers connected. Let's turn this up a little bit. Okay, we got both channels. AM's working. FM stereo. Ooh, a dirty tuning capacitor. Getting any stereo reception here. Okay, an antenna helps. And separation, your stereo lamps on. The meter is not working at all, it's just stuck in one position. You sure you parked over here? Dirty switches, obviously. Dirty switches. Does have its perks at times, but what are the things you see when it stops? Dirty switches. 
burned out lamp, stuck meter, we got a uh, dirty tuning uh, capacitor. It seems we have both channels working. It seems okay. It looks like we have all our functions. Let's go to Phono and listen up. Where is Phono? The switch is dirty as well. I'm getting a little bit of background hiss from the phono stage, but it's not objectionable. At full volume, we just got a loose intermittent switch here on the function. Okay, good idea what we need to do. So let's uh, get the cover off, get into it, and have a look inside. All right, the big reveal of the inside. Let's have a look. Some light smoke staining on the from the lamps. Everything else looks nice and clean. And it looks like we have a really nice clean example of an unmolested 330C. It's a little dusty, but it's really nice. It hasn't been touched. Now, when I got this, uh, I bought this off eBay. Uh, it was under the impression that it would need parts to repair. When I got here, I found out it had a blown fuse. I replaced the fuse. I think I tested it for a few minutes and then I just put it away and it's been sitting in uh, kind of limbo here for the last three or four years waiting its turn but it's a really nice example it's uh, very nice and clean nothing's it's got all the original silicon on the output transistors see it there now I think Harman Kardon when they uh, started building the 330C they redesigned a few things here quite a few things actually well it's the whole thing's been redesigned from scratch uh, I think the only thing original maybe would be the phono stage amplifier it looks it looks pretty much like every other amplifier I've seen in a Harman Kardon it's very small board but even this looks like it's been re 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 redesigned Okay, so scratch that. The phono stage is new. Uh, I'm not looking at any circuits yet, but it now has a power supply board at the back corner here, which has fusing, rectification, voltage regulator, filter caps, all, all in one board. And then we have our power amplifier at the back here. It still uses a quasi complementary outputs, like these are all NPN devices, but the, there is no um, output uh, blocking capacitor, DC blocking capacitor any output. I think they did away with that. It's now directly connected to the speakers. And I think... No, I'm just thinking out loud here. The tuner. The tuner looks like it's been all redesigned. They relocated the tuning capacitor to the middle. And the AM FM is all on one board now. Everything looks really nicely laid out we have down under here we have our tone board now which has uh, power supply filtering for itself and then it's got all your tone control switches looks like it's all on one big long print circuit board down underneath and uh, one of the most pleasing aspects of the 330C is they redesigned the front panel and they gave it this smoke glass look with the silver controls on the bottom and uh, everything's been re... the basic layout's the same, you still have your knobs in the same position and your th five switches power and your headphones still there it's all basically the same but it's all a, a new look, a more modern look I like this font they use. Some of the fonts they used in, on the 330C is, is uh, pleasing to the eye. So let's uh, let's take the bottom off and have a look at the bottom. Now I noticed in all the screws, it looks like nobody's been into this before because the screws are all like factory fresh. They're not stripped. 
top, that's for the top and bottom covers. So it doesn't look like anybody's been in here. Uh, we got some dust. It looks like we got some kind of oil slick staining. That's grease. That's a grease stain. Some kind of a... I wonder if somebody sprayed in some contact cleaner and just flooded it. But look at this, it all looks pristine and untouched. This will be a nice receiver to work on. Looks like they took my advice and they rewired their speakers with 18 gauge. This is all 18 gauge now. On uh, these two fuses down here, these are the fuses for the amplifiers. And they uh, supposed to be 1.5 amp. Let's see what this one is. It's a 2 amp. Okay. Let's take it out. Oh no, sorry. It says 2 amp on the back, so they upgraded this fuse size to 2 amp. So that is the crack fuse. Okay, I'll shut up and put that back in. This one's a 3 amp. That one's incorrect. Okay, I'll replace this one. Everything looks original, untouched. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to do some baseline tests just to see what kind of a power output it has, uh, just to get a feel for um, maximum power output. It's a good indicator of you know how everything's working. So we'll do that, do a quick test that, and then we'll start with our uh, our work. Probably what I'm going to do is. Probably going to end up recapping the entire thing. Uh, I've seen these before where the caps are like 50 years old, but they're all they all test perfectly. But in this case, I'm going to replace them because 50 year old caps don't have much life left in them, no matter how they test. So that's my thinking. So we'll do that, and uh, so we'll get together a cap kit and build put one together, and we'll see what we can do here. Something I don't do often enough is check these load resistors. These these take a beating. I've abused these for a long time now. Put several hundred watts through each one of these and they're only rated at 100 watts at 8 ohms and that's if they're properly heat synced. Uh, 100 watts is quite a bit of heat to come out of this little package. Um, I put, like I said, I've put several hundred watts into each one and I'm just going to connect it up and test see if they're still accurate. So this is the first one. So there's the first one. That one's still good. I'm going to run with that. And then I got the other one here for the other channel I use. Is a... This one's out a little bit. Not bad though. It's still probably within tolerance. This one's seen a little bit more stress, I think. So I'm going to run with those. All right, I'm going to wire it in for a quick and dirty power test here. I just want to get a base reading on a few things. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I'm wired in. Let's get auxiliary set up. Everything's centered and ready to go. Let's power it up. And wait for the amplifiers to come alive and turn up the volume. Set up my scope. Got an awful looking waveform here. That's because something is not right. All right. So I got both channels set to five volts of division, turning it up, and you can see we're going to get some uh, 
You get some clipping on the top. Ten volts of division. Let's go there. What is going on here? That's balance. Okay, here's a look at channel two, the right channel. Put, start putting the power to it. It's got a really awful distortion. I'm gonna keep going, keep going. Breaks into clipping. Oh, there it goes. So we may have a bad transistor in here. So we put a little power to it and it kind of snaps out of its snaps out of its uh, little freak out there. Oh there it goes again. I just want to try to get a reading on maximum power. If I heat it up by going like this. We're in the right channel, eh? Just wondering if I got a bad transistor here somewhere. Poking around, not seeing anything moving. Okay, there's our full power. If we can get it stable, I'll get a reading on it. Read about there, 15.9. So the amplifier is working. It just has a lot of issues. Let me see if I can get some cold spray on this. See, now it's warmed up. It's stopped wigging out. I'm going to spray a couple trannies here. See if we get any reaction out of this. Nope. Nope. It might not even be in the power amplifier. It could be in the in the uh, down here in the tone board. Ooh. Didn't like that. Let's try. It. Yeah, look at that. It's going back again. We might have a problem on the tone board. Let me try again here. Yeah. I sprayed some caps. Now look at how it's reacting. I'm going to heat those caps up. Okay, let's spray the caps first. I'll show you what I'm doing here. I'm spraying those caps underneath the uh, tuning drum there. There's a, a row of caps. Now if I spray them, you see how the Signal starts wigging out. So I'm not saying that's the caps. It could be some other part in that vicinity. But uh, it's definitely something in the area, I think. Now it's behaving again. Give it some more. Could also be just a switch. Let me see switches here. Could be that switch, that's the tape monitor. Let me spray this switch.
Yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah, it's probably just a bum switch. So now we're back in business. We know what's going on here. Let's uh, let's go back to nothing. Gonna do some square wave tests. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Looking not too bad. Base cut, base boost. Still having problems with the switch. Treble cut, treble boost. Okay, looking pretty good. Let's go up in frequency. Hey, what are you doing? Why are you moving on your own? It wasn't, it wasn't even turning in. Cheat Chinese. Okay, here's 10 kilohertz. You're not too bad. Go up. Oh, your air boy here, we're losing our square wave. And that's 24 kilohertz. Hundred and twelve kilohertz. Hey. Okay. Alright. I think we got enough information here that we can uh, figure out what's going on. Okay, one thing I want to do is measure the rail voltages with no load and at full load, just to, so we can calculate the uh, amount of sag we're getting in the power supply. So we got it powered up right now. This is this big copper trace here is our ground, but above, above it here is our mains. Our main voltage, I think, here and here, getting 58.0. Okay, so we have 58.0. Let's turn this up until we get clipping. Right here somewhere. That's right. Right there. Both channels clipping, just touching the rails and We've got 50.4. It's actually pretty good. It's holding up pretty well. Now I think what I'm going to do with these switches is they're all pretty messed up uh, as we just saw on the last test. I'll replace these three. These are small signal switches. These two on the outside, they're kind of a special high current switch. They have a, they have a little different construction to them. I'm going to clean these two and I'll replace these three. These are, these switches, they're, uh, you can buy these on a DigiKey. Actually, it may not work. Let me see here. I have to make sure all the dimensions are correct. Because if you don't, then the buttons, okay, that looks good. Just want to make sure this is good here as well. This one here is really sticking out. Sticking out about two more millimeters than it should. Hmm.
Yeah, I'll go ahead and see how it works, how it looks when it's done. What we have to pay attention to is the buttons, how they protrude. And the length of this shaft is not identical. I don't think it is. Compressed. Should be. Let's bang on. Extended. It's about two millimeters out. Hmm. We should still be able to do it. Okay, let's do one of these switches together. I already did this one. It's pretty simple. So all you do is you pull back the spring. You get a good grip on it if you can. Pull it back with your fingers. And then lift out the latching mechanism. And then your plunger comes right out. And it's got contacts on both sides. Just put this aside careful. Now, what you're going to need is you're going to need a, a cotton swab that will fit inside that cavity. Okay, we know it's going to fit. So let's give it a shot of 401B. I'm going to use 401B. Just give it a shot down the cavity. And then we're going to get in with our cotton swab. Carefully. And you want to wipe this side and this side. Because that's where the contacts are. Give them a good scrub. Give it multiple cleanings if you want. I think one is good enough for here. It's not really pulling out any black. As you can see, it's pulling out the old lubricant, but it's not pulling out black. So, and even these aren't black either. They're pretty good. These are good wiping action switches. They have a good wipe action to them. So, just want to make sure that spring doesn't come flying out and pop this across the room, then you're in a world of hurt. You will be changing the switch out. Now I'm going to use uh, the Oxid D100. D100. And I'm just going to place a little bit on each of the four sliders. No need to go crazy. Now that's the top because it has the latching, the, the car votes for the latching mechanism. So we got to put it in this way. Just carefully slide it in. And make sure that our contacts are in place, stay in place. Pull back the spring. Mm hmm. Okay, let me try this again. Actually, I could just pull it back like this with one hand. And drop this in. At least a spring. And okay, those are good. Clean up the excess. All right. Yeah, you could tell there wasn't much oxidation on these. Okay, those can go back in. But first, we need to install some of these. So, these are pretty much drop-in replacements. Uh, one thing you gotta pay attention to is how the pins line up. These ones, the new ones, are about a millimeter out which isn't going to harm anything. It's uh, There's lots of slack and play in the holes. But if you look down the, the pins, you can see some of them don't line up properly anymore. But that's okay. So let's put this one in and lock it into place. OK. 
Okay, our other new switch. Same thing. Let's lock it in. And our last one. Now they don't have to be tight. Once they get soldered to the board, they're all going to be held in place. But there it is. Three new switches. Now I need to fix some of these up. I was pulling these off and uh, they came apart. So I'll have to re-glue these back together before I put them on. And they use glue to uh, put the See, that's on there pretty good, but this cap here needs to be. Now you can see the difference between the new and the old switch, how the protruding I was talking about earlier. Um, now most people won't notice the difference, unless you're a real finicky on, uh, on cosmetics. What you could do is you could take, cut, probably maybe a millimeter off the back end of this button and it would sit a little lower I don't think it's necessary though I think it's gonna be fine this one here where is it yeah I'll glue these on now Might be noticeable. I'm just going to give these a clean with some blue glass cleaner I have on the rag. Now I'm going to use is a this is a solvent based craft glue, so it's going to stink a little. We can get it to flow. Okay, so I'm just going to put a little. Probably like half a drop in each. I wonder if that's going to be enough. Maybe a little bit more. Think about that much. Maybe this stuff is pass its sell by date. I'll see how this holds in the end. Once the uh, the solvent evaporates, it'll give me a Yeah, it's smearing. Okay. Ready to go back in. Perfect. Slaughter that back. All right, so I just finished the tone board. I put, what, 10 or 12 new caps, two new transistors, three new switches, and uh, treated and cleaned these four pots. Treated these switches, cleaned them. I checked resistance values, and they're all good. And cleaned the back of the board. So this is all ready to go back in. Now I'm looking at this wiring here. This is a speaker wiring going to the back. And it goes underneath the transformer and uh, beside the power supply and out. I'm gonna move these wires because there's mains voltage right here. You can't see it. Because this normally is tucked up underneath like this. And this is all mains voltage under here. So I'm gonna remove these wires and run them on the other side of this transformer. But I have to get them out from under here. So I'll do that. I got the main filters removed and I'm testing them right now. This is still at 600 microamps of leakage and it's been on for like 15 minutes. So these, these caps are done. 
um, they test um, high in value. Let me turn this off. Okay, the original filter caps are 6800 at 35 volts. Now these are measuring up around 7200 microfarad. And uh, they still have decent ESR. But what I'm going to do is these got high leakage. I tested them and I was getting uh, around a milliamp of leakage inside. So not cool. So I'm going to replace them with these 10,000 microfarad at 50 volts. And they'll just drop right in. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of rework here on the underneath the chassis. Now this is, seems kind of silly to me the way they ran these speaker wires. They come from uh, the back. They come, oh, you can't see it, but way in the back corner here there's some fuses that come off the amplifier. And then it comes back all the way around and it goes underneath these transformer wires and up alongside this AC power and then back out again. I'm just cut them. I'm going to remove them from here just seems silly running it all that way and just pick up noise. This thing here you can turn 90 degrees and we can just run it like this. It's a little cleaner option I think. So, so I cut these and I left the insulation on so I know what color they are. So I can do these one at a time and I don't get them mixed up. So I'll just remove Remove some of this uh, dead wire here. It wants to pull the pin too. Okay. Now that was gray. Let's take the gray wire. Let's cut it and strip it, and then we can reattach that. Right about there. So that's how much we're eliminating. We're going to do that for each wire too, and that's going to all add up. This is all resistance we're removing from the uh, amplifier. I think if you remember back in part one, when I talked about internal resistance for amplifiers, especially on the power grounds and speakers, and that's where all your current is. That's where you want to have your best uh, wiring, your lowest resistance overall. and. Uh, Every little, every little bit helps. So let's just get this wrapped around. And re-solder this. Okay. Now, I get to do the other ones. This, uh, Having it run down here is not bad. This is okay. It's away from this. This uh, red and blue wire is power going to the tone board. And the rest of these signal wires are all shielded. So you should be okay to uh, have these run next to power lines and stuff without getting picking up hum and noise. All right. So I'll do the other ones. Um, Let's go work on the other side here for a bit first. So this seems silly to me. We have um, the big change with the Harman Kardon 330 series between the A, B and the C model is the A and B had power fuses. Now these two fuses on the back corner were fuses for each power amplifier, right? They're 1.5 amps and if your amplifier drew too much current, it popped the fuse and that channel will go dead. Now, what they did in the 330C is they put speaker fuses in. The power comes straight from the power supply, goes in. There are fuses on the power board. There's two 4 amp fuses, but they supply, those fuses supply protection for both amplifiers, not just one. So we have power coming in on the blue and red, okay? Our red is our positive, blue is our negative supply, and it comes in from the power supply, which is fine. The green wire and the purple wire is our speaker out. Now it runs, this is green wire goes up here, goes all the way around and down to the fuse, 
and then it comes all the way back, all the way across, all the way to the speaker switch. The speaker switch, it goes all the way back to the outputs. So I'm gonna eliminate this right now. I'm gonna remove this speaker wire and I'm gonna just go cross country and shorten it down quite a bit. Remove a lot of it. Okay, let's get this cleaned up. My sucker's plugged up. I'll have to fix that later. So we got this out and it's all twisted too. So let's remove uh, the purple one as well. Okay. So now we remove these wires all the way up. There. So what I plan to do is just run these wires up here and then eliminate all this. Cut this all off. This is all just extra wiring for no reason. And then we'll get rid of some more milliohms that way. It's all about the milliohms. Let me twist this up, make it look nice. And then I'll bring this up here. The green goes here. So I'll cut the green wire. Get rid of this. Get rid of the green. Okay. I'll attach the green here and then I'll run the purple to here. Let's do one at a time here. I think I got it too long. I'll cut another half an inch off. And strip this. Okay. I had to take a time out. My solder sucker was plugged. All right, let's clean this up. stripped. Let's wrap it. And make sure there's no short here because the positive positive uh, rail voltage is right next to it. Make sure there's no strands, loose strands this up. Okay, solder this. So we just eliminated a foot of wire here, probably more than foot, maybe 14 inches. And we're going to do the same with the purple wire. We're going to go up here, cut it to length. length and then we're going to wrap it and solder it. Now here's another eight inches gone. Strip this. Now these changes I'm making probably won't make any noticeable difference not in this because we're already using 18 gauge wire it's not like we're using 24 or 22 like in the previous models but this will help in reducing any internal resistance and it gives the amplifier a little better transient response a little better power output a little more kick not that this is a high power unit but every little bit helps okay i'll wrap this up Okay. 
And when I clean the boards, oops, well, it wants to pop off. When I clean the boards, I'll give that a good inspection, make sure there's no shorts. All right, now I'll get back to this and finish this off. There's one capacitor here in the, in the middle of the tuner board. It's marked uh, C267 or 276, sorry. And the board's marked 100 microfarad, 10 volts. Even in the, in the service manual, it says 100 microfarad. But in reality, you'll find it's populated with a 47 microfarad. Now, what this capacitor does is it's a dampening capacitor across the tuning meter. So what it does is it kind of acts like a to slow down the, the neat meter movements. You could put 100 in there if you really want to, or you could leave it at 47, depending on how you're uh, wanting the speed of the needle to move at. doesn't really matter. But for whatever reason, they probably thought the needle was moving too slow, so they dropped the capacitance by half. Okay, what I need to do now is repair the tuning meter and replace lamps. One broke, one burnout lamp for sure. Now there's two ways to do this. You can go in through the front door or the back door. There's only two ways. You've never done this before. One thing I suggest you do is take out a screw and see if the glue has been broken. Somebody's gone through and broken the glue on this one already. Now, I really don't recommend doing it this way. This thing is so brittle. This corner is already broken off. And uh, on my 730, it's actually broken, cracked, because somebody was pulling at it and it cracked it, the, the dial face, the dial scale. So if it's glued, I would suggest not going in this way. If it's not glued, the glue's broken, I, you could do it. It's just uh, be careful. Uh, the other way is remove this top screw. and loosen the bottom screw. It's a little tight. Do the same on the other side. Now you should be able to tilt this forward. Now there's two screws up top here. Take these out. Oh, it's tight. Why is that so tight? It's because nobody's had it out before, that's why. Terrible. Okay, we tilt this forward and we can take this off and just slip it up through the dial string. Just be careful. Hooked up on the. There you go. Now you're not going to have a whole lot of wire to play with, but you get the message here. You kind of, you can lift it up, and you can change all your bolts. All right, we have a bum meter, stuck needle. Pretty common for these meters of this age. This is, I think, this is 1978. That's what that is. Uh, yeah, a lot of these meters get stuck after the, after time. Now there's a couple ways you can do this. You can take the tape off and remove the shell, the front shell cover, and then you can work on it there. We're going to go in the back door and try this. Remove this tape. Tape's pretty much perished. Let's get rid of this tape. A 
Okay, there is an adjustment screw here, one in the back, and then there's one in the front, but you can't really see it. So let's just loosen this one off a little. It might be locked. And oh, there it clicked. They have them locked with uh, thread locker or paint. Just keep slowly loosening it off. There we go. Now it's free. That was easy. What I'll do is I'll put some power to it and I'll test it throughout its whole range. Cover this up with some more tape so the dirt and crap doesn't get in. There's a magnet in here. And if uh, any pieces of steel or iron or whatever gets in there, it can jam up the mechanism. So you want to cover that up. Okay. I'll just use a little Kapton tape here. Don't need much. Okay, I can put that back in. Oh, look at that. Seen some trauma. I wonder what that's all about. Looks like somebody jamming with a screwdriver is trying to pry something. It's not very good. Yeah, and you can see how the incandescent lamps cook the back of the meters. Turns them all brown and dark. And uh, eventually that'll get darker and darker as the heat continues. I wonder if there's a way to stop that. Well, you put an LED in its place, we'll stop it, but... Good. Okay, now for the tricky part. This is uh, not that easy. You have to get the light bar hooks onto the front um, subframe here. There's a hook, and you have to, if you look underneath, you can see it, and it hooks on, um, there's a ledge there, and it just hooks over top. Okay, I got that. And you have to line up your screw holes so they match. And then you need to get your incandescent bulb in the little hole there to, for your stereo lamp. And then you need to make sure your meter's in place. And I can't get my finger in here to push this meter up. I think a little double-sided sticky tape on the bottom half of the front of the meter might help. There we go, I think it's, no, nope, not quite there yet. You really got no room for your hands, that's the problem. Okay, I think it's in. Now, the bottom of the light bar hooked. And I think it is. It's a little fiddly as you can see, so I'm gonna try again here. It keep, keeps jumping out. Now why does... Let's go over a bit and down. I'm gonna make sure the meter's in place, that's the main thing. I'm gonna spin this around to have a look. The meter's good. Get this corner. There we go. Okay. Now we need a couple screws. One here. They don't make this easy. If I can get one screw in, it'll hold it, and then I can let go. Come on. You can't see this. Let me try over here. Okay. Now we're good. The meter's in place. We're hooked underneath. If you look under here, you can see it's hooked. 
and we're over top the two screw holes bulbs not in its place jumped out we can position that with be careful not to break the wires let me take the screw out it back and then put the bulb in. There we go. Damn it. Incredible pain to do with this with the uh, camera in my way. Can't see for one thing and then the camera is not blocking my access. And this is God damn it. Okay. Okay, I'm just replacing transistors here in the power amp. And the long tail pair originally were 2SC 1345s. Nothing wrong with them. They both test fine. They have a beta of about 550. And they're still going strong, but they are uh, notorious for failing and uh, doing something bad. So I usually just change them out. So I'm replacing them with a KSC 1845s. And I put two of them here together. They're both facing the same direction. And then we tie the emitters together because the emitters are tied together in the circuit. And then there's just enough room here. If you bend the legs right, you can get it in on the board. Let me see. Collector base goes in here. The emitter. I can't see. Okay, maybe I can see better from here. So I'm going to go for collector first. Believe me, it is possible if you can get coordinated enough. I just can't see anything right now. Okay. I gotta pull this one forward like that. There we go. Okay. Get the base in there. You push it down. It works. Holes are big enough that you can get the legs of two legs through, so that works. And just yeah, and this hole stays open. This is an emitter for the other transistor. Just block this off. All right, here's a look at all that I went into this receiver. So this is all redu redundant wiring that I yanked out. And uh, since I did a little bit of rewiring, this is all extra. So this is all scrap now. Now the caps, for the most part, the caps were good. These are Elna caps, except for these ones. These are Elnas. These Elnas hold up really well, uh, but they're still 50 years old, so don't, don't bet on them too hard because they'll they'll fail you. These ones they're holding up. Um, some of these smaller ones they really drift out of tolerance. They're mo more. Some of these are more than twenty percent out of tolerance. So that's the main reason why these were all changed. Aside from the age, one fuse lamp, fifteen uh, of the silver legged transistors from Hitachi. These uh, are. 
to SC 1345 to SA 844 and where are they? There's one more here. To SC 458. Those three transistors. I'm not going to say naughty list anymore because every time I say naughty list everybody says send me a, a copy of your naughty list. I want to know what they are. It's the same list that you find on Audio Karma. There's a top 10 worst transistors or top uh, something there's a, th a thread there that says top 10 uh, worst transistors. These are known failure transistors. That's why I changed them. They all test fine, but they're coming out because I want this receiver to perform for the next few decades with no problems. That's why it's all, all new caps. Some of these transistors are gone. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much ready to go. I think I'm going to plug it in now and uh, set up the amplifier and then we can start doing tests all right just going through doing setup the amplifiers i have it powered on and i set both amplifiers to about 9.5 millivolts across one emitter resistor that's the uh, power consumption right now sitting at idle 20.1 watts or 21 watts um, now the the book says 10 millivolts across one of the emitter resistors and I measured it out to about, I set it up for 9, 9.5. And here's the other channel, 9. And for DC offset, it's looking pretty good too. I think I got here on, this is the left channel, I got 9 millivolts on the right channel. I got 1 millivolt. So everything's looking healthy. I think we're ready to put some uh, signal through this and test it out. I'm going to get everything connected, get my load connected, and then we'll do some power tests. All right, we're all wired in to do power tests. I just want to check. We have our tone on speakers one. These switches are still... You hear buzzing? Not very good. These other switches are working good. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's turn off the noise, turn on the load. Now I don't have two cameras today, so let's see here. I'll put you up on the camera so you can see. Okay, there's our two channels. Let's wrap up the volume. And what are we going to get? Here's our clipping. Back it off a bit. Huh. We're at uh, clipping there. Let's start our timer. And we are getting 15.25 uh, volts RMS on the output. It seems that might be low, lower from what I read before. I'm not sure. So actually, I actually have a little bit of clipping on both of them. Let me back this off a bit. Right to this point here, and it's 15.08 volts RMS. Okay, got the timer started. Let's uh, just sit back and wait and see how it does. Total power consumption is 116.5 watts. Okay, where are we? We're at the rope with the seven minute mark here. I'm just checking a few things. These fuses are getting hot. They're around 45 degrees. These are the four amp fuses that are uh, protecting the power amplifier. They're taking full current and they're warming up they're yeah they're about 45 degrees I can feel that this uh, bridge rectifier is up over 90 
heat sink itself is doing pretty good. We're at about 43, 45. Uh, let's see here. Some devices. 49's peeking out here. Does this have a high low? Yeah, about 45 degrees on the heat sink itself. It's doing pretty good. Just gonna let it keep going. Okay, we're at the 10 minute mark. Let's check some more stuff here. Fuses are up around 50 degrees C. I'm getting 50. Rectifier. Bridge rectifier is up at, ooh, 105. That'll sizzle an egg. Uh, heat sink is still under 50. We've got no problems here on the heat sinking. It's all under 50. Okay, good. How's this doing? It's up around 80 degrees. It's, it's taking quite a bit of. Okay, shut this down. Let's try square wave, set you up. All right, here's a thousand hertz tone. And let's go up in frequency. Five, six kilohertz. Six kilohertz. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, the top one's noisy. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, twenty two kilohertz. Starting to lose our shape here, pretty good. Not bad for a little scope, or not bad for a little amplifier. One thing I'm going to do I'm going to check the power supply sag between full load and no load. So let's get this, ramp this back up to full power. Okay, 15.2 volts RMS. Got a voltmeter here, can you see it? Yeah, you can see that. here now 49.8 57.3 okay well, that's it for the testing it works pretty good no complaints no issues I think I'm ready to just wrap this up I'm going to start dressing the uh, dressing in the insides, getting everything ready, and uh, put it back together. To 
All right, well, there it is, it's finished. I'm really pleased with the outcome of this one. Uh, There's a lot that was going on here. Um, now I screwed up a lot of the testing I did at the beginning. I wanted to get some kind of accurate power tests from before and after, and I screwed up. I, had, I took power measurements before, but it was only for one channel. And that is totally wrong because it was sh displaying something like 15.9 volts RMS on the output. One channel. The other channel was off. So that's why I had such a, a bad reading on that. So I couldn't use that data. So that's unfortunate. But next time I'm going to get a little better prepared. Um, this uh, receiver is going to go on my listening desk and I'm going to have some fun listening to it for the next little while. Now, I had some feedback on the 330A that I did in the first part of this series from the owner and he's happy with the, the sound quality of that. And I was really impressed with the sound quality of that one as well. When I first connected it up and started listening to it, I was really blown away. Um, it sounded great. And uh, I listened to it for a couple weeks, and then I gave it to my uh, client, and he's been listening to it. 330C is working pretty good, and I'm happy with the power output, happy with everything else, happy with the tuner. Tuner's working great. I did have a lot of troubles with these switches. I put three new switches in that eliminated that problem, but I still have a little bit of trouble with this speaker switch. It is still a little scratchy, I think. Might have to go give it. I don't think. Well, I did. I did treat it with the oxid, and it didn't seem to help. So I might have to go in and replace that switch. Well, there it is. I finished uh, all three receivers, um, part of the three-part series. Uh, personally, I don't know which one's my favorite now. I, I did actually think the 330C was one of my personal favorites, all-time favorites. But then after I've worked on these two. It made some modifications. These two actually shine pretty good as well. I'm really impressed with how these ones turned out. You know, they had we went through, we looked at some of the weaknesses they have, and we did some fixes for that. And uh, they're all star performers. So if you ever get your hands on one of these, it doesn't matter which one it is. I think you're you're good good to go. Um, the earlier models, you might want to do some modifications because they got some weaknesses. They weren't the greatest. In, uh, when they came out of the factory but as they went through the the two uh, successors they made a lot of improvements so I'm gonna take a listen to all of these and I'm gonna see which one I like the best I don't know it's gonna be tough it's gonna be really tough but uh, we're gonna figure this one out so anyways thanks for watching take care we'll see you on the next one